Now, so I'm going to begin, as always, by um, introducing Dr. Vandenberg to you. Um, and so this is our very last lecture, class 26, May, May 6, 2021. It's our seventh legacy lecture, and it's from Dr. Laura Vandenberg of the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. Now, Dr. Vandenberg is one of the busiest uh, academics that I know, and on top of an immense <coughs> uh, amount of uh, research and interaction literally with the international community, as you'll see me uh, talk about. And uh, I, I can't be too glowing about Laura, I really can't. There's some glowing stuff coming up. Uh, should, uh, Dr. Van Boer is also the Associate Dean for Undergraduate Affairs, and she has about 3,000 undergrads where she worries um, about about you know looking, making sure they're properly looked after, et cetera, for her entire College of Public Health at Amherst. So um, we know this because where our company is interacting with Dr. Vandenberg's lab, and she is the hardest person to schedule. We have her calendar, and it's completely full virtually all the time. All right. So there's no doubt that Laura is a key dame champion of sustainability and a heroine of the chemical dimension of sustainability. In all my years of engagement across many fields, I, I collaborate in. In the challenge area of chemistry and sustainability, I've come to hold Laura as the preeminent young scientist in leadership for the chemical dimension of sustainability. Dr. Van Berg is remarkable in her scholarly leadership abilities in the young community of scientists for helping to steer the chemical enterprise and the country towards sustainability. She's one of the very most promising young scientists, sustainability leaders at the still relatively early stage of an independent career who have come to know well over multiple fields in 41 years of independent academic work. Dr. Vandenberg's brilliance and perseverance in pursuing sustainability goals for the common and future goods are truly exceptional. So for 14 years during the periods <coughs> when Dr. Vandenberg was a postdoctoral fellow at Tufts, and then a professor at University of Massachusetts Amherst, we have participated together with up to 25 other scholars on hundreds of monthly telephone calls with multiple boards as members of, 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 as members of multiple science advisory boards aimed at helping Mer America and the world come to terms with EDCs. Dr. Vandenberg shines for the energy of her participation, the incisiveness of her scholarship, the wisdom and log logic of her insight, the courage of her positions, and the power of her command of the English language. In terms of courage, <laughs> I've seen Laura eat. <laughs> you know, you, you don't literally bite them or chew on them, <laughs> but these industrial guys come along and try to undermine. <laughs> and I've literally seen, figuratively speaking, uh, I remember once in Berlin in particular, but other, <laughs> other uh, aspects of well, where, where Laura is literally, uh, shall we say, frequently speaking, eaten them alive. Um, she was for much of this time, the only young, young scholar on these boards of up to 30 plus otherwise senior scientists. The communal efforts have helped to quickly advance public understanding of the dire low dose adverse effects of everyday everywhere chemicals that you've been learning about in this class. I mean, without Laura, um, and, and other people as well, but Laura is so key. Without Laura, we'd be way behind, decades perhaps behind, in understanding how deadly endocrine disruption is. Without the efforts of young scholars like Dr. Vandenberg, which include continuous strategic maneuvering and forthright characterizations to counter the denialism tactics of the chemical industry and its trade associations, we would not have endocrine disruption as the widely recognized phenomenon of great concern that it must be. Endocrine disruption, just to, since it's the last uh, lecture, I'm going to make this point again. Endocrine disruption is the worst news to ever hit chemistry, as you well know now. The mere idea that traces of everyday chemicals in amounts that people are carrying in their body fluids could be disrupting cellular development and uh, that should be is developing really and signaling to produce impaired 
uh, creatures sounds like the plot of a science ho uh, fiction horror movie. Yet copious evidence from wildlife, lab animals, in vitro studies, theoretical studies, biomonitoring, epidemiology, and accidents indicate that with endocrine disruptors, this is precisely the situation we are in today. <clears throat> Dr. Vandenberg is the personification of what the world needs in academic leadership in this area. So Professor Vandenberg is trained as an endocrinologist and developmental biologist, focuses in her lab on understanding the effects of hormones and estrogenic EDCs in the development, function, and disease of the mammary glands. Works to understand which data uh, used by regulatory agents and how those data do or more often do not protect public health. She was a key contributor to the creation of the tiered protocol for endocrine disruption, which I've told you about several times and haven't had time to go into the details thereof. She is an author of more than 100 peer reviewed studies and about a dozen book chapters. In terms of panoptic scholarly and intellectual leadership potential for sustainability, Laura, Laura Vandenberg's simply amazing. I'm repeating myself, but it doesn't matter. Her scholarly understanding of the endocrine system, endocrine disruption, epigenetics, and the connections with chemistry is equivalent to the best senior leaders in the field of environmental health sciences and chemistry. And the people that you could put in the chemistry uh, class there is extremely uh, small, the number. Research at the interface of chemistry and sustainability mandates strong interdisciplinary scientific engagement. Dr. Vandenberg's integration into the leadership of chemistry and sustainability is unprecedented for a young EHA scholar and is undoubtedly proving to be a, of great benefit for the world, to the world. Her leadership abilities projected, among other things, by her skills in explaining endocrine disruption to diverse scientists, regulators, and the public, and it's simply a marvel to behold this. I really think she's a precious asset for science, integrity, and common sense in the American and international civilization. So after saying those things, Laura, I'm going to stop sharing and ask you to take over. Um, well, thanks, Terry. You know, um, and you'll have to let me share my screen. You can make me a co-host to do that. Yeah, um, I, this is really uh, I just want to tell everyone that it, it's so lovely to hear such amazing things about yourself. But then I was just looking for the email that Terry sent me a few weeks ago where he told me I was the bride of Chucky. <laughs> so I'd given, I'd given an interview with, uh, with a reporter about disinformation campaigns. And he told me that uh, I look sweet, but, will I, but I will come after you. And it was one of those emails that when you open up your, your, uh, your inbox in the morning, I literally laughed out loud and then I had to go find my husband to read this email to him that I, you know, one of the most flattering things I could be called first thing in the morning was the bride of Chucky because I, I take that and I'm, I'm proud of that. So, um, so I think that that he could have summed up everything that I've done with that instead with a, just a picture of that doll. Um, cause I, I, I am proud of the things that I've done to sort of, um, address, uh, address you know the 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 world that we live in um so i'm so so excited to talk to you today about um, my work um and then also some of the life lessons that i um i think will be helpful to you especially since i'm your last speaker of the semester um so i'm trying to be a little bit introspective so i'm going to tell you some science stuff but i'm also going to give you some you know what i think are the biggest life lessons um, first of all, my science hero is Rachel Carson, and I'm sure many of you have read Silent Spring. Um, if you haven't, please do, but Rachel was just a beautiful writer, and she has several books um, that show her appreciation for nature in a way that I actually think a lot of us with with COVID and having to reconnect with nature is one of the only places where we can see our friends outdoors. Um, I think we can... Um, we can re reinvestigate how she saw the world. And I love this quote, um, that if we're going to live so intimately with chemicals, eating and drinking them, taking them into the very narrow of our bones, we'd better know something about their nature and their power. And this to me is one of the sort of driving influences around what I do. 
And so there's there's actually a, a movie, um, a, a documentary called Rachel's Daughters that that um, interviews the next generation of scientists after Rachel Carson who have worked on the connection between the environment and breast cancer. And, and it's a beautiful film, but it's it's about 30 years old. I think it was put together in the 1990s when I was still in high school. And uh, you have heard about and actually met some of Rachel's sons and daughters. Um, unfortunately, you couldn't meet Theo, um, who passed several years ago, um, but you did meet Pete Myers. And Theo and Pete were really um, some of the first to tell the story. And I believe you've read this book. Um, and if at least the book was assigned to you. Um, if you haven't read it, please do read it. Um, because it's a it's now the story that probably predates most of you um, that uh, that tells the story of the beginnings of the field of endocrine disruption. And you've met a lot of these folks who are the sons and daughters of Rachel Carson. Um, I don't think that you met Anna Soto, but she was my, she is, was my PhD advisor, still um, living, still very active in the field of endocrine disruption. And we have lost a few like Lou Gillette um, who passed several years ago, but was really a leader in evaluating the effects of endocrine disrupting chemicals on wildlife um, and was speaking for creatures who otherwise um, are sort of forgotten. Um, I became fascinated by the story of, um, of the field of endocrine disruption really because of the story of diethylstilbestrol. And I apologize if you've heard this story already, but this is the one that really brought me into the field um, because it's a story of endocrinology. It's a story of um, you know early life exposures to hormones, but it's also the story of human hubris. And I find it fascinating how often we have thought that we know more than we do. We've thought we can control more than we can, and we've been terribly wrong. So if you don't know the story of DES, DES was a drug that was prescribed to somewhere, several million women in the United States alone, um, but also throughout the world between the 1940s and the early 1970s. And it was prescribed with the intention of preventing um, miscarriage. And it promised, this is a real advertisement. It, the, the doctors who prescribed it promised all kinds of things like bigger and stronger babies. No evidence for this. This is the 1950s where you could lie in, a, in an advertisement for drugs. Um, and in fact, it was later shown that it doesn't prevent um, miscarriage. So it, it, it's actually, it didn't do anything of benefit um, to, the, to the women who took this drug. It was originally prescribed to women who were at risk for a miscarriage because they, they had had one previously, but it was thought that it was so healthy that you could give it to anyone. And so it was treated like a prenatal vitamin. And in fact, sometimes it was packaged with prenatal vitamins. So the way the story goes that in the early 1970s, there were several young girls um, that developed a cancer called clear cell adenocarcinoma of the vagina, which is a very rare cancer and is normally seen in elderly women. And the way the story goes, some of the, those girls were seen by a doctor named um, Dr. Herbst. And one of the mothers said to Dr. Herbst, is this because of that drug that I took when I was pregnant? He said, probably not. But then he started to ask all the other mothers. And in fact, they had all been prescribed DES. And so he wrote a paper with his colleagues published in New England Journal of Medicine in 1971 and, um, and DES was banned. So how is this an endocrine disruption story? DES is an, is an estrogenic chemical and it was prescribed to women because there was this mistaken idea that if some estrogen during pregnancy is good for you, then more must be better. And so, right, that we, we often have these ideas, again, this human hubris of like, we think we understand things and the, the, the whole concept around giving people more hormones as if more would be better um, is, is, was unfortunately very, very wrong. Um, the other thing that really got me fascinated in the world of early life exposures to hormones was the story of human twins. So twin girls who have two placentas, um, so non-identical twins, have just slightly elevated exposures to estrogens in the womb, and it increases their risk of breast cancer. 
a woman who has a male twin has an increased risk of um, infertility. Um, and there's effects in both directions. And I hate to say it like this because um, I'm a biologist, so I just have to say things. It's true for farm animals too. People, humans don't like to be compared to farm animals, but we're actually, there's many things that are very similar and the endocrine responses of animals and humans are often very comparable and we can learn a lot from them. So by looking at sheep and cows, um, which have mixtures of singleton and twin births, we can actually understand quite a bit about how early life exposures to hormones alters physiology, behavior, morphology of organs and long-term health. I found that fascinating when I was really young because it was something I had never heard about. And it proved to me very simply with very clear data that even small levels of exposure matter. And in this case, we're talking about natural exposures, right? Being a twin, there's nothing pathological about being a twin. So I have become very interested in chemicals that have hormonal activity. And at this point in the semester, you've heard a lot about these endocrine disrupting chemicals. So I'm not gonna give you all the introductory slides about what that really means. Um, although I'm obviously happy to answer your questions. What I worry about is less about specific chemicals. I'm, I'm not terribly interested in picking chemicals for the sake of, um, of studying individual chemicals, I'm more interested in chemicals that mimic estrogen because that's the hormone that I find the most fascinating. And they're found everywhere, these chemicals that mimic estrogen, as well as other endocrine disrupting properties. Um, and we're being exposed to them every day through living our lives in perfectly normal ways. And most of us are not even aware of the fact that we're being exposed to these chemicals um, from these various products or things. So this is a list of some of the chemicals that we've studied in my lab. Um, so I, my early career was focused on BPA, bisphenol A, and I've shifted to looking at bisphenol A replacements, um, the other bisphenols. Um, I look at ethanyl estradiol, which is a chemical in birth control, which we often use as a positive control because we know exactly what it does because it's birth control. Um, we study oxybenzone, which is a chemical in sunscreens, um, but it's also added to a lot of consumer products because um, it absorbs UV and so you, UV rays. So you can add it to plastics as a way to protect what's inside the plastics from breakdown from UV. Um, I've been studying one of the phthalates, and I know you talked about phthalates earlier this semester, um, and we've been studying BBP, uh, which is used in flexible plastics, including vinyl flooring, um, and it's estrogenic. Many of the other phthalates are not estrogenic, but we've been studying it because it does um, have some estrogenic activity. Um, and I'm also interested in parabens, which are added to uh, con um, cosmetics and also a lot of packaged foods or processed foods because they have antimicrobial activity. So you don't want, you know, gross stuff to grow in your eye makeup because then you get, um, you know, eye diseases. And so we add these antimicrobial agents to our cosmetics. And my favorite organ is the mouse mammary gland. It is, I think, the most beautiful thing you have ever seen. And I'm, I'm talking it up here. Um, and I know that, again, this is a weird thing to get really excited about, but my students fall in love with this organ also. I have, in my office, in my lab, or in my office at work, I have a painting on the wall behind me of a mammary gland that a student made for me. I have a coffee mug with a mammary gland on it. They buy me mammary gland stuff, which is super weird to walk around with a mammary gland on your on your coffee cup, but most people don't know what it is because when you see the pictures, you'll see that they're really beautiful. So the mouse has five pairs of mammary glands that lie along the ventral surface. Um, it's not like a human breast or a cow udder. They don't hang off the body. They lay flat against the body. And from an experimental perspective, this is to have 10 mammary glands is really awesome because you can expose one animal and collect a lot of different mammary tissues that you can use for different kinds of biological measurements that you're interested in. And I like to describe the development of the mammary gland with the metaphor of a tree. 
So um, in early life, prior to the onset of puberty, the mammary gland is like, um, it's like a little twig or a little sapling. There's not much to it, not much to talk about, but it forms as um, epithelial structures. So that's the business part of the mammary gland, the part that will eventually make milk. Um, and that's also the part of the mammary gland where tumors are most likely to arise. And they're surrounded by a fat pad. Um, and in all the mammary glands you'll see in my pictures, there's often a, a lymph node that provides us with a landmark to tell us about how much this mammary gland has grown. At puberty, the mammary gland starts to really grow. So we have you know, that, those early sapling trees that are quickly growing. Uh, the mammary epithelial structures are driven by these highly proliferative, um, they look like little bulbs, like, uh, like Q-tips or, or the old kind of light bulbs that we used to have on the ends of the ducts. And, and those are inside those structures are highly proliferative cells that help push these ducts through that surrounding fat pad. And then in adulthood, if you never have babies, your mammary gland looks like a wintertime tree. So lots of branches, lots of, you know, you have a big fat trunk there, but no, no leaves on your trees. During pregnancy and during lactation, the mammary gland undergoes an entirely new developmental period where it starts to produce structures that are called alveolar buds and they look like leaves or flowers on the tree. And these are the structures where milk is made. And the milk is made in these flower-like structures and then sent back through the pipes, the ducts to the nipple where um, the offspring will nurse. And then after you wean your babies, you don't need all of these these structures anymore because you're not making milk anymore. So the leaves fall off the tree and it looks like a fall time tree. So the mammary gland will undergo another period of development. And trained as an endocrinologist and a developmental biologist, I'm fascinated just in general by the way that hormones drive these different stages and that I, I think that we should think about them as stages of development, um, which also means that they are sensitive to environmental insults. So I've just turned that picture on its side because I want to show you the most beautiful organ in the world, which is the mouse mammary gland. This is what it looks like prior to puberty. Uh, this is the pubertal mammary gland. So this whole thing fits in about this much space of this picture. So it grows very rapidly. This is a period of about 12 days in the mouse life. So a very, very rapid growth in a very short period of time. And you can see here on the ends of these ducts, and here I have a close up, those bulb like structures that I referred to. This is the adult mammary gland. So it looks like a winter time tree. It's a little bit bigger than the pubertal gland. Um, and otherwise, you see it's pretty boring that you have mostly just these um, looks like a winter time tree. There's no leaves on the tree, it's just branches and one big trunk back here, which is the nipple. This is the mammary gland during pregnancy. So you start to see those flowers forming on the tree. And I've got a close up of those flowers. So these are um, structures that will eventually produce milk. And here's the lactating mammary gland. So it is chock full of these structures that are producing milk. Um, and here's a close up picture. Um, and those are referred to as alveolar buds. So I don't have a picture of um, the last step, which is involution because um, we rarely allow our animals to get that far. So in my work um, in recent years, I've really become fascinated with milk production and whether the environment is influencing milk production. And I've been asking whether some of these estrogenic chemicals that we study alter nursing. Now I show you pictures of beautiful babies because um, I think that they're, it's important to remember what the purpose of our work is, is to, to reflect back on, on humans. But everything I'm gonna talk about today comes from the mouse. But I do wanna say that there is evidence from human studies that environmental chemicals can interfere with nursing. And this is a really difficult thing to study because there are a lot of other um, socioeconomic factors that influence whether or not women can nurse as long as they want. There's a lot of um, other external factors. So women who are um, you know, working in a fast food or retail um, job often aren't given the space or the time to, to nurse. And so they make choices that are the best choices for them and their families to stop nursing. That's not the kind of thing that I'm 
I'm focused on or worried about, obviously it worries me, um, but what I'm, I'm worried about are women who have all of the, the intention of nursing, all of the support for nursing, and yet their, their breasts don't produce enough milk um, or, or don't produce any milk. And in fact, 80% of women report having problems with nursing. Um, and there have been studies that have shown that environmental chemicals are associated with earlier weaning. Chemicals like DDT, Rachel Carson's um, uh, one of her uh, insecticides of interest, but also chemicals like perfluorinated chemicals and BPA, which are still chemicals we worry about a lot. So we started, and I'm, I'm gonna mix up which chemicals I talk about here. Um, uh, in my talk, um, because I think that it's less important the specifics of the chemical and more important that we focus on chemicals that are estrogenic. So I already have talked to you a little bit about what you should expect to see in a lactating mammary gland. And it really is this very full carpet looking structure. And in animals that are exposed to BPS, and these are animals that were exposed during pregnancy and lactation, so only as adults, we saw that their mammary glands were less dense, that they, um, they, you could see through these structures. So they have fewer of the structures that produce milk. And when we-, we Laura, might, might, I, might I just interrupt to say that BPS is a BPA substitute where the two, the carbon dimethyl unit linking the two phenols is replaced by SO2. Thanks, Laura. I forget you're chemist, so you care about such things. <laughs> I often have to talk to biologists about chemical structures and I tell them that BPA is a chemical that sort of looks like the Batman symbol and BPS is a chemical that also looks like the Batman symbol. So we should not be surprised that two chemicals that have very similar structures have very similar outcomes on health. Um, and yet we know a ton about BPA and relatively little still about BPS or BPAF or BPF or BPB or many, there's like 29 to 50 replacements. So we also found that if you were, um, if you were a mouse and you were born to a mama who'd been exposed to BPS during pregnancy and lactation, you were delayed developmentally. Um, and this probably has to do with the, um, with either the quality or the quantity of milk that that mom could provide for you. So one of the, the hallmarks of development for a young mouse is eye opening. Um, so mice, just like puppies and kitties, they're born with their eyes shut and their ears are actually shut also. And um, at postnatal day 14, so at two weeks of age, about 90% of control mice have their eyes open. And yet the animals whose mothers had been exposed to BPS, um, they were delayed. So more of them still had their eyes shut at two weeks of age. Um, we also saw, I'm gonna show you a little video. So this is, these animals are two weeks of age. Um, and what's normal is for, I've rem I had separated the mom from the babies for about 10 minutes. And when I put her back in the cage, this is normal behavior. These pups, they want a nurse. So they will chase her down. I feel bad for the moms at this age. They just can't get away from their babies because the babies are at this stage, they're very mobile. So she can't get away from them, but they don't have teeth. So they can't eat food yet. They're still dependent on mom. They'll get tooth teeth about two days later. This is really normal behavior is these pups are trying to suckle. Mom is not having it. At some point she'll lay down and she'll let them nurse. But, um, but they should be pursuing her. And what we saw is that even though the BPS treated animals are, um, are less developed, they're less seeking of milk from their mothers. It may be that they can't see her, but they don't need to be able to see her to seek her out. They find her by smell, they, they find her by hearing. So we've altered this connection between the mother and the pup by exposing them to BPS. And I just want to also note, I say low BPS and high BPS, but both of these are very low doses. Um, this dose is um, right around what people are exposed to. And this dose is a bit higher than what people are exposed to. But if you consider how quickly the mouse metabolizes chemicals, it's actually much lower than um, the amounts that are in people's bodies. We also saw that there were changes in the way that the mothers that had been exposed to BPS interact with their babies. 
So like I said, at, at early ages, mom has to spend a lot of time um, on the nest taking care of them. But by two weeks later, the pups are very mobile and she can spend less time on the nest nursing them. That's very normal. What we see with the BPS exposed moms is that they become <laughs> helicopter moms, right? They're spending more time on the nest. And that might seem like a good thing that they're like spending more time parenting, but in fact, it's probably because they can't make enough milk. And so they have to spend more time nursing. And that might, that's an adaptation, but it, it's an adaptation with cost to the mother because now she's spending less time feeding herself. She's spending less time taking care of herself. She has to spend this time on her babies. We also wanted to know if environmental chemicals alter other aspects of maternal behavior. So one of the ways that we evaluate maternal behavior is with this, um, this test that's referred to as a pup retrieval test. So what we do is we take the mom and the babies out of the cage and separate them for about 10 minutes. Then we sprinkle the pups back in the cage away from the nest. We put the mom in the cage on the nest and we look to see how long does it take for her to go and touch her babies, like to go interact with them, because a good mom will go find them right away. And then how long does it take for her to pick up the babies and, re and uh, replace every single one of them to the nest? So in this video I'm showing you, the nest is up here in the upper corner. She's kind of messed it up, but she right away went and touched her babies. And now we're gonna wait and see how long does it take for her to pick one up and bring it back to the nest. And we give them 10 minutes to do this. At the end of 10 minutes, any babies that are outside the nest, we return to the nest. Because at this stage, uh, they'll get cold and die if they're not returned to the nest. The other thing you can see here that's a good thing, she's gonna pick up this baby and take it back. There, victory. You can look closely. There's a little white mark on the sides of all of these babies. That's referred to as a milk band. So we can see that she's been doing a good job nursing her babies. When we looked at the animals that had been exposed to BPS, the animals uh, at different stages that had been exposed to BPS took longer to touch their babies and took longer to bring their babies back to the nest. So this is an example of a mom who's done a good job. She returned all of her babies over here to the nest. They're nicely tucked in. Sometimes they even cover them up. They're like, Laura, please stop touching my babies. She tries to hide them from me. This is a mama who did not do a good job. She's scattered the pups in the cage. She's destroyed her nest. And so at the end of the um, 10 minutes, we help her um, and put them back together for her. The other thing that we noticed is, um, is animals that are exposed to environmental chemicals. This is an example of ethanyl estradiol, but we've seen this with other estrogenic chemicals they display obsessive compulsive disorders. And these start a few days before they give birth and they last about seven to 10 days um, during lactation and then they go away. Um, and the reason why this is important is that about 10% of women will develop pretty serious obsessive compulsive disorder um, right around the time that they give birth. And it's, it's baby directed obsessive compulsive disorder. So obsessive checking of the baby. Um, and it's considered obsessive compulsive disorder because it disrupts other normal healthy um, activities or behaviors. So I'm gonna show you this video. In this case, the mama's nest is way back here in the back so you can't see her babies. She's gonna come to the front of the cage. Let me turn off the sound. She's going to retrieve her tail she does this little twirl like a little ballerina. And then she comes back to the front of the cage. She finds her tail. She picks up her tail. She does a little twirl and she returns to the nest. And she, did, she does this over and over and over again. So there, there's no purpose to this behavior. Um, and we see this, each female that does this has her own unique way of doing it. So this, I just think she's adorable, um, but you can imagine this is time that she could be spending sleeping or nursing or cleaning herself or eating. And instead she's spending it on this um, behavior that has absolutely no purpose. So are there long-term effects of these estrogenic chemicals on the mom, on her health? Um, we've just started to look at this because most of the time we had been um, we had been collecting samples from those mothers. We so we have to euthanize the animals, 
And we had been doing that either during the lactational period or right at the end of the lactational period. Um, and in fact, I have to admit some of my earliest work where we were interested in the daughters, um, which I'll tell you about in a minute, we, we had not looked at the mothers at all which is a shame. Like I think about all the years that we were interested in the mother, the daughters and we were so focused on the daughters, we forgot that the mother might also be important. Um, so one of the things we've started to do is to expose mice during pregnancy and lactation to these chemicals, allow them to have babies, allow them to nurse the babies, wean the babies, and then let the mamas sit for a while so that they undergo that process of involution, that fall time tree where the leaves fall off the tree and see whether or not exposures to these chemicals during pregnancy and lactation have permanent effects on the mom. And um, this is again, just a reminder of what the mammary gland looks like in an adult female who has never had babies. So she's nulliparous, never pregnant. And it's a wintertime looking tree. So we see only branches um, on the tree. And this is a, a female who had babies, she nursed them and then we wean them. So this is five, day, five weeks after weaning. So this is the fall time tree. So it looks different, but it's not that um, plush mammary gland that normally has all the leaves on the tree. When we looked at the mammary glands of mice that had been exposed to oxybenzone, this is that estrogenic chemical that's used in sunscreens um, and also plastics and other consumer goods. What we saw was that um, with the highest dose that we looked at, these animals had an appearance that was somewhat between the pregnant, the, the never pregnant and the, um, and the once pregnant but, um, but involuted mammary gland. So why does this matter? Number one, it tells us that there are permanent effects on the female and that they last a long time. But the reason why we're interested in, in this is that pregnancy is thought to be protective against breast cancer. And if you're exposed to environmental chemicals during pregnancy, we're worried that you may be losing some of that protection that you naturally would gain by having been pregnant. And that's what we're studying mechanistically. Um, and I think I just have one slide that talks about some of the details where we've looked at oxybenzone, which here is referred to as BP3, it's benzophenone 3, and another estrogenic chemical, propylparaben. And we looked at how hormones um, like estrogen naturally induce these, um, these damage to the, um, to the DNA of cells in the mammary gland. And that's shown here, this is one kind of damage that's formed that's referred to as an R loop, which is a three-dimensional structure that forms between DNA and RNA that causes double strand breaks in the DNA. So estrogen does this, but our body is able to repair those breaks. These chemicals also cause that damage to our DNA. And our question is, and one of the studies that we're currently pursuing, is whether or not our body is able to repair that DNA damage in the same way. But it was really shocking to find out that these environmental chemicals are having this kind of DNA damage because no one thinks about them as carcinogens or genotoxic agents. And for, in the large part, people don't think about estrogen in that way. And really estrogen is a carcinogen. Estrogen is um, a natural hormone that promotes cancer. So do environmental chemicals affect the health of exposed daughters? Again, you're seeing people pictures here, but I'm looking at mouse. Uh, these are mice whose mothers were exposed during pregnancy and lactation. And then we look at the daughters. One of the most fascinating things that we've seen has been um, anxiety-like behaviors or obsessive compulsive behaviors in the exposed daughters. I'm gonna show you a video. You're gonna see right away that this is not normal behavior. So this is um, a, a mouse who was exposed, I think in this case to bisphenol S and she is, this is what she does all day long. And remember daytime is when mice are the least active. So this is her sleeping time. And this is um, the kind of behavior that she has. Unlike the mothers that experience those stereotypies, those behaviors that have no purpose, and they, they experience them for a few days before giving birth. And then for about a week after giving birth, these animals do this throughout their entire lives. Um, so months or years of these kinds of um, behaviors. 
adorable if you're trying to assemble a group of mice that you can take um, as like a circus performing act. But um, if you start to think about what it would be like to be a mouse like this, you recognize that she probably is experiencing a lot of anxiety like behaviors. And in fact, um, these little blocks here are things that we add to the cages when animals experience anxiety as a way to try to distract them. So they're chewing blocks, we give them toys, um, and it doesn't, it doesn't really mitigate those behaviors. We've also seen permanent effects on the mammary gland. So these are animals that were exposed again in, um, during early life to bisphenol S, and then we wait and look at them um, in adulthood. So they've spent most of their life not being exposed to this BPA replacement chemical. The control animals have that wintertime looking tree um, in their mammary gland. These are animals that if you showed these mammary glands to a veterinary pathologist, they would tell you that these are these are pregnant animals, but they're not. So we've totally changed the morphology and uh, in other cases, the health of the mammary gland by exposing them in early life to low doses of BPS. Um, the daughters also have disrupted maternal behavior. So the mothers become helicopter parents. Their mammary glands are less productive, so they spend more time on the nest. Their daughters become bad parents. They spend less time on the nest from very early ages. They are more likely to commit infanticide. So they actively kill their babies. Um, they're more likely to provide poor care to their babies. So their babies are dirty um, or are bruised because the mama is, is not carrying them carefully. She's biting them roughly when she's moving them around. And um, in some cases, we saw really disturbing um, mater lack of maternal behavior. So I just want to warn you before I show you this movie. This is an example of a mouse who had been exposed early in life to bisphenol S. She was never exposed in as, as an adult. She um, is mated with an untreated male. And then um, this is her, how she, this is her her. her her cage. So we did not do anything to this cage. We did not disturb the pups. This is how we found it. So if you don't want to see this, um, uh, just look away for about 30 seconds while I describe what's happening. So this mama did not build a nest. Her nest is scattered everywhere. Her babies are scattered everywhere. And now she's having these, the stereotypy behavior of circling where she runs in circles and she has stomped some of these babies to death. So um, when we find a cage like this, and we only ever saw this in the BPS treated animals, never in control animals. I previously saw this with BPA exposed animals also. Um, we have to euthanize any of the babies because she's, she can't care for them. Um, so, uh, so this is an example of really severe um, deficits and maternal behavior, which we've seen, and I have only ever seen in animals exposed to, um, to estrogenic chemicals. This is a strain of mice that's a very good mom strain. There's other strains that are bad moms. They need, they need to have multiple litters to really learn how to be good moms. This is, this is a strain of mice where this kind of behavior is really shocking. So our data, and I, I, have, I have so many other papers and studies I could talk to you about. We also do look at the males, um, and I, I just didn't have time today to talk about um, uh, the male mammary glands, a fascinating organ. Um, uh, but our data and others really are, are supporting the idea that, that female health is affected by early life exposures to these estrogenic chemicals, but it's not just the daughters. And for many years, we focused on early life exposures having effects that might manifest later in life, like the story of being a twin in the womb. You're born looking totally normal, but your risk for disease is changed. But my lab has really also focused on the mom in a way that we, I hadn't thought to do before. And that's really opened up a fascinating world of rethinking what we mean when we think about who do we need to protect? Who is vulnerable? And the idea that for many years, that was a very pervasive idea that we don't need to worry about adults and adult exposures to endocrine disruptors. We just need to focus on, on the young. And it's not true. Um, at different stages of our life, we're differently vulnerable. 
So I do want to give you a few of my life lessons before I tell you about, um, about what we need to do, like your, the call to action. Life lesson one is that small things matter, little things matter. Um, this is true in the science that I do, right? The, the whole idea of like looking at tiny, tiny doses of environmental chemicals comes from the inspiration of tiny, tiny differences in hormone exposure in early life in twins, making a huge difference in health outcomes and physiology and behavior. But it's also true in life. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that I'm most proud of is the fact that I think that my writing is an opportunity to tell a story. And it's where little things matter. The choices of words that we use, the ability to really craft a story and to practice how we talk to people about science, little things matter so that we're talking to people in a way that they understand. And there's like a great quote that a lot of journalists use that is, never underestimate the intelligence of your audience, never overestimate their knowledge on a topic. And so my, my audience is always a smart audience, but I assume they don't know anything about endocrine disruptors because unfortunately, many people don't know anything about this topic. Lesson two, take opportunities when they come to you, but decide what your principles are and stick to them. So, you know, if a, if a chemical company comes knocking at your door and says, um, I want you to come work for me and I want you to come make sustainable products with me, take the opportunity, but figure out what your principles are and whether or not your principles align with that company. Are, is this a company that's saying, I want you to come and make, um, you know, a, a more earth-friendly version of BPA? There is no earth-friendly version of BPA, right? A more earth-friendly version of PFAS? There is no earth-friendly version of PFAS. So you have to decide what is important to you and stick to it. And I have had to make choices in my life, um, choices for my lab, choices of sources of funding, um, that have had to do with my principles and my ethics. And I'm proud of those decisions, even if they've cost me something at the moment that I had to make those choices. Uh, the third lesson is um, smell the roses in science, not just in life, but in science. We find all kinds of things because we took an opportunity to say, eh, let's, like, let's look at that. So an example here is the, the male mammary gland. I serendipitously found that BPA was altering the development of the male mouse mammary gland because I was learning to dissect the mammary glands and someone didn't trust me to dissect the female mammary glands. So I was like, I'll take the males. Like I'll, they were throwaway tissues. People didn't think the male mouse had a mammary gland because they don't have nipples. And by pursuing something that no one else wanted to do, I found something incredibly interesting. And now my lab has a whole project, a whole group of projects focused on the male mammary gland. And we're probably one of four labs in the world that look at the male mouse mammary gland. So we've built ourselves a little niche by finding something good that we were not really looking for. Lesson four, this is a really, awful one to talk about because this is where I think we continue to blow it in the, um, in the sustainability world, in the, um, in the world of thinking about chemicals is that we learn lessons and then we somehow unlearn them. So we have to keep relearning them. And the, the stories of regrettable replacements is this story, right? And yet we keep doing it over and over and over again. We, we remove DDT to go to the OP pesticides. And then we find out, oh, horror of horrors, those are bad too. And so then we move on and we, we move to the neonicotinoid pesticides. And then, oh boy, those probably are killing the bees. And so then we're moving on and we keep moving on with without the right framework to be able to protect ourselves from hazardous things. So we're not learning, we have to keep relearning and then we're unlearning. So we're making the same mistakes over and over again. BPA is an example. We were so excited to see that companies were moving away from BPA that it took us a little while to realize that it was just a bait and switch, right? They had removed BPA, they had replaced it with BPS or BPF or whatever, the other replacement chemicals that we knew almost nothing about. This is incredibly frustrating. The le uh, I think it's not exactly the last lesson, but this is the lesson I want to talk a little bit more about, which is speaking truth to power. And it's one of the things that, again, I think that 
as scientists, we have privilege that people really do want to know what we think about things, but we have to, you know, at the beginning of the call, um, as some of you are joining, um, Terry was talking about a colleague of his who's a chemist who he really admires, but who says terrible things about climate change. And, you know, I think as scientists, the most important thing that we do is we see where is my box of expertise and I don't talk outside of that box of expertise. So I don't speculate because it's easy to fall for the Dunning-Kruger effect where you think you know something that you don't know. Uh, you think you're an expert because you know a little bit. And I'm very aware of what I know a lot about and what I know very little about. And I, I try to stick to my box of expertise. But we also have to, um, we have to share our knowledge. And I believe that this is, it's a, it's a moral imperative to share what we know with the public so that, the, so that as a society, we can make better choices. I refuse to believe that the American public would knowingly choose cancer as a, you know, just, a, just something that we'll have to accept in order to have a sofa that will repel mustard. Right? If you said to people, would you rather have a sofa that repels mustard or reduce cancer rates across America, I think people would choose the reduced cancer rates. And yet we're not talking about the fact that chemicals that are in our sofa are contributing to cancer and that we could have fewer of those chemicals if people would stop eating their pastrami sandwiches on their sofa and thinking that they needed it to be able to repel mustard. So, you know, some of our changes that we need to focus on are, are behavioral changes and not, um, not chemistry changes. Anyway, the point of lesson five is speaking truth to power. And we need to speak up and we need to, to say what needs to be said so that we can fix this big problem. And this big problem is that clinical organizations and scientific organizations absolutely understand that environmental chemicals pose a threat to human health. There are numerous um, consensus statements, um, position statements, policy statements um, from scientific and clinical organizations. And many of these have focused on endocrine disrupting chemicals. And yet we haven't done nearly enough about these things to be able to address them. Uh, is mustard a real example or a metaphor for flame retardants? I'm actually talking about um, perfluorinated chemicals. We spray we spray our um, our uh, our um, upholsteries with perfluorinated chemicals so that you can uh, you can get lipstick on them and it'll come off in the wash, right? It, it makes them easier to clean. It you it it, it sounds outrageous. <laughs> um, uh, the whole story of flame retardants is separate. Uh, no, uh, perfluorinated chemicals are used as, um, well, for a lot of different purposes, but one is to create nonstick coatings. One is to create um, easier to clean um, carpets and easier to clean um, upholsteries uh, to create barriers between the fabric and anything you might spill on the fabric. Flame retardants are, um, are things like, uh, like brominated flame retardants or even the replacements, Firemaster 550, um, but perfluorinated chemical. Oh, I know what you're thinking of. Some perfluorinated chemicals are used to put out fires. They're used in firefighting foam. Um, but the perfluorinated chemicals in your sofa are used more as protecting the fabric from your bad habits. Um, and at least in the Boston area, there are these advertisements for furniture, um, furniture places that actually show you, actually show like your grandkids can come and they like drop an ice cream cone on the, on the sofa and then they pull out the garden hose and they hose off the, the sofa in your house. So we've created like, this is, I'm, I, I get angry about it, but it's, it's an actual reality that we're, we're selling these products to people as if they need a sofa that can repel in that case, a chocolate ice cream cone. I find that horrifying. Eat at the table. The thing that your, your mama says to you is, is the solution here. Okay, so what can we do about this? Um, so as a member of the Endocrine Society, I do a lot of talking to the public and people wanna know on an individual level, what can I do? 
not an individual level, there are some things that you can do to protect yourself against endocrine disruptors. So using a filter um, for your water, like a carbon-based filter for your water, um, vacuuming, mopping, and dusting much more than most of us do. Uh, having a, a good air filter in your house, choosing healthy foods as much as you can, um, organic food when you can afford it, um, avoiding canned goods um, if you can avoid them. But obviously I am pro vegetable eating. So if that's what you can afford, eat vegetables. Um, try not to spray pesticides in your home or in your yard. Uh, my, I, I'm surrounded by poison ivy here um, in Massachusetts and I refuse to spray poisons on them. Um, so I try to combat them with a little bit of vinegar, salt and, and dish detergent, but I have to do it every year and it's a losing battle. The best way to kill poison ivy is with a goat, um, but I don't have a goat. I, you can rent them in Massachusetts. Um, and being thoughtful about how you use plastics and trying to avoid plastics. These are like small things that you can do that don't really cost you anything um, and can make a difference in your um, everyday exposures. But here's the problem that I see is that we keep putting the burden on individuals who can't even see where these chemicals are, who aren't even aware of what products are containing these chemicals. We're asking them to do the heavy lifting when really we as a society need to be doing the heavy lifting. And, and as chemists, um, hopefully you'll be designing things that do some of the, the heavy lifting for us. I think that the regulatory agencies are at fault here, that it's our, the regulatory agencies that when I talk to the public at the end of my talks, they always say, I regularly get the question, but isn't someone supposed to be protecting us from these chemicals? And the answer is yes. And yet in my view, they do a very crummy job of protecting us and they leave the public at risk. And there's a bunch of reasons why. And some I think have to do with, um, the revolving door between regulatory agencies and the industries that they're meant to regulate. So people get sort of golden parachuted jobs uh, at the highest level of regulatory agencies as a way to, um, to interact with their future employers. But I actually think the system, there are many great people who work at the EPA. There are many great people who work at the FDA who are very well intentioned and the system is not set up right to evaluate chemicals properly. And this has been a big part of my career has been to try to shed light on this. And so let me just briefly illustrate to you how we evaluate chemicals for safety. Not we, me and my lab, but we society. This is, this is our contract as society with regulatory agencies and with industry. So we take animals, usually mice or rats, we force feed them a chemical of interest, usually every day of their life, which, and then we kill them, usually at one year of age or two years of age, but sometimes only after 90 days or 28 days of exposure. And then we weigh their organs. And you might be able to take out the organs and look at them for, you know, histopathology, so at cell-based structures, but that's not actually guaranteed for all um, organs. We're looking for health effects by weighing organs. And I don't know, I know you, you heard from Tom Zeller earlier this week, I don't know if he used the metaphor, but this is the equivalent of taking your car to a mechanic and telling them, oh, it's making this weird so sound like a chugga, 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 chugga. And the mechanic takes out the engine and weighs it. Right? Like you would never take your car back to that mechanic. And yet that's how we're evaluating chemicals for safety. We're weighing organs. So then we look for what are the doses that kill the animal? What are the doses that cause harm to the animal? These have various names that I won't get into. And then we divide the number, the, 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 the dose that didn't kill or harm any animals based only on organ weight. We take that number and we divide it by 10 or 100 or 1,000 because the regulator says, oh, mice aren't people, so we need to be more protective of people, or maybe children will be exposed to this chemical, so we have to protect children, or there's genetic differences in how people metabolize chemicals, so we need to protect against genetic differences, and we calculate a reference dose. We say, that's the dose that's safe for people, and then we look at what humans are exposed to. And as long as humans are exposed to less than that reference dose, that safe dose, the regulator goes, okay, everything's good. Everything's fine. People are exposed to safe doses of this chemical. And then what happens is environmental epidemiologists like Shanna Swan come along 
and they find effects in people associated with exposures to chemicals at perfectly safe doses of exposure. If you aren't watching me, I put safe in scare quotes. So we have literally thousands of environmental epidemiology studies that suggest harm. Okay, so I got a great question. How does organ weight indicate cause of death? It doesn't. <laughs> so cause of death in the case of these animals is, uh, a, it, none of these animals die a natural death. They are, they're all euthanized at a very particular um, point, like one year of age or two years of age. But the point is really, how does organ weight in an animal tell you anything about health in a person? And the answer is, it doesn't. And that's why this is horrifying to us, that this is how we're still testing chemicals, is to see, did the weight of an organ change? How do they, quantita how do they quantitatively assess that a certain organ weight means the chemical killed the animal? They don't. In some examples of studies, they will purposefully feed an animal a dose to see how many animals will die. That's looking for an acute death. So usually that's like how many die within the next three days or within the next day or within the next week. We very rarely do those kinds of studies because they're immoral um, and uh, they don't really tell us much that's useful either. So instead we do these long-term studies where we force feed animals chemicals and then we weigh their organs. It's nonsense. I know it doesn't make any sense. And I'm going to show you an example of how we know it doesn't make any sense. So this is a, a phthalate. This is not one of the um, chemicals that I study, but this is a very well studied phthalate. And uh, we test at very high doses in rats. And we see at those highest, highest, highest doses, there's changes in anogenital distance and nipple retention and um, not even the weight of any organs. You have to go to even higher doses in order to see changes in the weights of organs. So this is the dose that has no effect on those outcomes in the rat. And this is human exposures. So the regulator feels really good that there's a big difference between the doses that cause harm in animals and the doses that people are exposed to. And then an epidemiologist like Shanna Swan comes along and oops, there's changes to the health of the male at these very, very low levels of exposure. So I, I know that none of this makes sense. Oh, euthanizing animals isn't immoral. We can talk about animal studies, but uh, about the morality of animal studies in general, but I think it's more immoral that we expose people to things that we haven't studied in animals than to not study them in animals at all. But we could talk about that. Um, standard assays evaluate hazard by weighing organs, which is nonsense. Um, it doesn't tell us anything about the kinds of outcomes that are actually relevant to people. And in fact, um, in meeting with regulators at the US FDA, they have said that if a chemical causes obesity, obesity is not an adverse outcome, which is shocking because the FDA will sell you drugs to try to treat obesity. And yet if a chemical in your food causes obesity or a chemical that you spray in your house causes obesity, that's not considered an adverse outcome. We have no way of evaluating with organ weight diseases like asthma that are increasing in human populations and especially in, um, in communities of color. We have really crummy ways of evaluating thyroid toxicity, which you heard from um, Tom about in the last lecture. And I've shown you that there's behavioral outcomes that we have seen in mice exposed to low levels of chemicals. Weighing the brain tells you nothing about whether or not an animal is going to experience a, um, uh, a um, you know, a behavioral outcome like ADHD or anxiety-like disorders um, or OCD. Uh, we need to demand better from companies and industries and we can. So this is a great example um, from Japan. It's actually many years old now. Um, the, this was looking at college-age students and 
these are college age students who were drinking tea and coffee beverages from cans that were lined with BPA. And so they asked them, how much do you drink? Very little got um, put into column A, a whole bunch got put into column D, and then they measured how much BPA was in their urine. And with more consumption of these tea and coffee drinks, they saw more BPA in their urine. Well, then the company that packages these drinks came along and they added an extra can lining that would prevent the BPA lining from interacting with the beverage itself. And then they went back and they measured how much BPA was in the urine of these college students. And they saw even the ones who were drinking a lot of these beverages did not have these higher levels of BPA in their urine. So this is an example of a change that came at the level of a manufacturer. Now, ask me what they were exposed to instead, I have no idea, right? That wasn't part of the study, but it's an important part of the question is we reduce BPA exposure, are they exposed to something else instead? Important question to ask. But we also, again, have to remember that we can't just tell people, avoid this, avoid this, avoid this, avoid this, because it works sometimes until it doesn't work. So this is an example of a study that was done at the Silent Spring Institute, where they brought people in, they measured the BPA in their urine, then they gave them a huge intervention where they would cook for them. They, uh, they avoided touching certain things like thermal receipt paper. And so they saw their exposures come down, but not disappear. So they're still being exposed from places that even the Silent Spring people don't know what they're, where they're being exposed from. And then they went back to their everyday lives and their exposures went back up. Well, in another intervention study um, where they tried to cook for people, keep them isolated, don't let them touch certain things, their exposures to one of the phthalates went up during the intervention phase. And it's because the chef that they brought in to cook the organic food brought in a spice that had been wrapped and packaged in a phthalate that no one realized. So even with the best of intentions, when we tell people, oh, just avoid that. Oh, don't buy that product, buy this product instead. We are potentially exposing people to things that we're not even aware are there. And part of this is because companies don't have to disclose what they use in their packaging. So we're always acting on what we know at the moment, which is constantly changing. The last thing is that I have become very interested in recognizing when people are lying to us, when industries are lying to us. And we refer to this as manufactured doubt. So this isn't mistakes. This isn't um, you know, information that we just didn't have at the time. It's when an industry or a group knows something and purposefully manipulates it as a way to promote their own agenda. Um, and uh, a, one of my students and I were looking at five case studies to be able to identify the strategies that are used in industries that are well documented to have um, manufactured doubt, like the tobacco industry, the coal industry, um, some groups that have focused on um, climate change denial. Um, and what we found is that these tactics, there's a couple of them that really overlap amongst all of the industries. And they're things like attack the study design, um, in ways that have nothing to do with weaknesses in the study design, but are intended merely to attack the science or employ experts who aren't really experts in the field, but are experts in something else to, to suggest that the work is garbage. And we see this in the endocrine disruption field all the time. Um, I'm working on oxybenzone. Oxybenzone is a sunscreen agent. Um, and oftentimes the industry will go to the same dermatologist who will talk about how um, we don't have epidemiology studies to suggest that oxybenzone is dangerous because we've never looked at populations that use a lot of sunscreen and compared them to populations that don't use a lot of sunscreen. Number one, that's not true. And we, we do have population level signals that oxybenzone is causing harm. But number two, it's a lack of understanding of what epidemiologists actually do or can do. And they go to someone who doesn't have the expertise to talk about it. The unintended effects of environmental chemicals could have, uh, sorry, the effects of environmental chemicals could have unintended effects on several generations. You've heard from others about um, epigenetic alterations. It's possible that by altering maternal behavior, 
we can also alter future generations. If you have poor care, you become a mother who provides poor care to your offspring. This has been shown in rodents and there's also some evidence for it in humans. So it's another way of transmitting the harmful effects of environmental chemicals. So I like to live as much as I can by the seventh generation principle, which comes from some um, Native American tribes that tell us that we should not just think about our children or our grandchildren. We should not just think about future generations we can conceive of, but future generations that are so far into the future that they are merely hypotheticals and consider how every action that we take might affect them. The last lesson I'm gonna leave you with is that the sum is greater than the parts. I work with amazing students, uh, mostly undergrads, but also some fantastic grad students that have stuck with me. And um, a lot of the work that I showed you today is actually their work. So I'm very grateful to them. This is our socially distanced um, picture from this past year where we're actually spread out uh, by, by feet in order to hang out together. Um, so I'm going to happily answer any questions. I saw something else popped up in the chat and um, I, I'd love to hear what you have, what you, what you want to ask me. Oh, it's okay. You are you are welcome to distract me during my talk. Um, I'm used to I'm used to talking to to, to teaching students, so it's great. Um, right. So the immorality. I think it's immoral to um, expose an animal to chemicals so that they die from the pain of having been exposed to that chemical. I think that the kind of um, like a planned euthanasia is a planned death. And at least if it were one that I could pick for myself, I would rather go for the planned euthanasia. But again, we could talk about like morality, immorality, animal testing. Um, it's always, always a tricky subject, but, um, but I'm happy to talk about that. And I'm gonna stop sharing so I can see you all and you can ask me any questions you have. Does anybody want to pick up on uh, the issue of animal studies? Because it is a, it is a critical uh, point uh, with all sorts of tricky issues around it. I think for, for me, morally with animal studies, what puzzles me is what the benefit is because the entire point in posing these ethical questions of is it ethical to do this incredibly harmful study on a living being is what is the benefit going to be for other living beings and then we continue to fund these studies and then these studies continue to not be taken seriously for the effects on humans essentially the animal studies happen and then it's said it's argued that it means nothing for people and that unless we do a study on people we shouldn't regulate the chemical in which case it feels like those animal deaths are completely useless thank you for that point adrian because i i do think that that's it is incredibly frustrating that um that we continue to evaluate chemicals in academic labs and then that data continues to not be used by regulatory agencies. I wouldn't say that the knowledge is useless though, right? Like we understand all kinds of things we could not possibly understand without having done the studies, but we're not protecting the public with that knowledge. I think that that's the frustrating part. Um, the, the studies that the industry has to do currently to demonstrate safety where, where I kill, you know, in a study where I need 100 animals, they use like 10,000 animals. Because if you're weighing organs and, and looking at the kind of outcomes that industry looks at, you need larger, larger group sizes in order to see effects. So it's, it's a double whammy of immorality, in my view, of like, right, like the, the balance of weighing, weighing organs, I think, gives you really crummy results. And you need a ton of animals in order to get those crummy results. Like, what are we doing here? Um, and then they actually don't even protect people because we're we're still exposing people to things that we later find out are harmful. Like, it's it's like triply damning in my view. Um, there's there is a big push to not use animals in testing, and I'm all for it. But here's the problem: the way that the EPA has defined an adverse effect is that you have to demonstrate the effect in an intact animal. 
So you can't say, well, I have, I have kidney cells in a dish and I see effects on those kidney cells. Therefore, we shouldn't expose people to this chemical because the industry will sue the EPA and say, that's not an intact animal. That's not an adverse effect. So um, what we need to do and what I've been working to do is to push agencies to change what they mean by adverse effect so that we could go to a type head like system. So if you saw that a chemical acts like an estrogen in a dish, it's an estrogen folks, right? And instead industry wants to say it's an estrogen in a dish, but that's not a person and that's not an animal. So they've set up the system to say, you have to test this in animals, but then we're not gonna test that in animals. And then we're gonna expose people to it. And then when we make you sick, oh, sorry, there's nothing we can do about that because you need a sofa that repels mustard, right? They set up a system where they move the goalposts they set the rules and then they change them whenever they don't work for them. And so this is where we need to be brave because we need to say to our regulatory agencies, we can live with your decisions. We're okay with you deciding I can't have a stain repellent sofa. I, I can live with that decision, right? If it means healthier people, I will live with that. And I'm also okay if every once in a while you're wrong and we've accidentally regulated a chemical that would have been okay. But I trust cell-based data enough to know that if something acts like an estrogen in a cell, it's gonna act like an estrogen in some creature's body at some period of development. So, so Laura, that's uh, quite a remarkable point, obviously that, um... Uh, that your your confidence in, in the cell data and clearly if you have cell data you really have something that, uh, that will give you pause uh, uh, concerning the uh, commercialization or the ongoing commercialization of the chemical but still endocrine disruption is so complicated that let's suppose you don't find an effect in a cell you still really wouldn't you think have to do an intact organ organism because there are all the other cells involved in the process that uh, could be impacted. Yeah, I mean, you can't study IQ in a dish, right? Like a lot of the things that we're interested in, you can't study in cells. My point is, if we studied all chemicals in cells and you found out that 50% of them were bad in cells, you'd never have to kill an animal. Right? You'd never take those 50% to animals. You'd save all of those animals because you would say, for these chemicals, we already know enough. We shouldn't expose people because we have data from cells. Maybe the other 50% you find nothing in cells or nothing that's serious enough. I think you still do need to go to animals and there, but still we could start with fish. We could start, not that I think that a fish life is less valuable than a mouse life, but as a person who has worked with fish, frogs, Drosophila, uh, and um, mice and rats, I somehow found it easier to kill fish and frogs. It's never easy to kill mice and rats. It's not. Um, it's a serious thing that I take very seriously. And I try, and we are required to keep the numbers as small as possible. Same with, with frogs and fish, but it's just easier for me. And I never thought twice about killing Drosophila, but so don't judge me. I'm certainly not a Buddhist. Um, but uh, uh, I, I think that we could learn, and that's what type head was set up to do, was to flip this framework on its head so that you would never kill a mouse or a rat. You'd never kill something with a spine if you knew from something without a spine or cells that it caused harm. And think of all of the money we would save. We would save, we would save, it's right, it's not just about saving people's lives. We would act, this would improve business decisions. Because instead what happens, in my view, is that companies are so invested in their chemicals that they'll turn their back on their data. When, right, it's like, okay, well that happens in a mouse, but will it really happen in people? And they find all these ways that they can do backflips to suggest that what you see in a mouse won't happen in a person. And mice are not perfect surrogates for humans, they're not. But, if something causes harm in an animal, are you gonna say, like, if you were gonna go get a vaccine, and I hope you have all been vaccinated if you're able to, you're shaking your head yes, or you have planned to, please go get vaccinated. But imagine you went to the doctor and, they, and you sat down for your vaccine and you said to the doctor, I'm really interested in getting vaccinated for um, you know, this new evolving disease, disease X, um, but this vaccine, is it safe? And the doctor said, well, it killed the mice, but you're not a mouse, so you'll be okay. You'd be horrified, 
right? You'd be like, don't give that to me. So if something harms animals, we should assume it's going to harm people. If it doesn't harm animals, it doesn't mean that it's safe for people, right? But it gets us a step closer. Right. That's actually, uh, I, I, those are excellent answers to what I was saying. Um, I, I said in the chat that I was in no way like coming at this from like an ethical perspective of we shouldn't do animal studies. It was just uh, critiquing how they're used. Um, but Adrian, I think you should be asking, should we be doing animal studies? You should be asking the ethical questions because they're the things we should be wrestling with. I, I don't take that as a, an right. attack on me or my work. It's exactly the question we should be asking because we, we're doing, a, we're killing a lot of animals we don't need to be killing. And that is a moral problem. Right. And then also from the moral uh, animal perspective, um, I, I, I said this in, a, in another class, I really don't understand how the argument, it hurts animals. We don't know if it hurts humans works, not, not just in what you said in that doesn't make logical sense, but in the sense that any chemical that we industrially produce and put out into the environment is going to affect every living being on the earth. And part of the purpose of our regulatory agencies should not just be for human health, but even if something is completely, completely safe for people, but kills animals, we should still not be releasing that into the environment and killing animals on mass. Like there's no logical explanation for why you could why you would to any ethical degree argue oh well it doesn't kill humans so it's fine amen i have nothing to say to that i just got a little shiver through my body you are absolutely right we this is when i started by saying that some of these are stories of human hubris like we value human life to such an extent that we have forgotten that we are one species of how many on the planet and that's it's 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 a shame the worst part is that we don't even value human life that highly. Clearly. Oh. <laughs> right. And, and so it's like, if we, if we value human life so little, how little do we like, we neg like essentially zero value in animal health and environmental health. Hey, Adrian, if I might chip in, I, I think your point is incredibly important. If we do not um, uh, get over this, the everything other than us doesn't count, which is, very significantly an industrial position, uh, we, we're not going to make it. Um, we're part of an entire ecosystem. And if we say that we can beat everything else up in the ecosystem except ourselves, it makes absolutely no sense. Laura, um, thank you for this remarkable lecture. <laughs> Extremely informative. I learned, learned a great deal. I'm sure everybody learned a great deal. Um, We've had a wonderful uh, series of legacy lectures and having this one at the end was just perfect. Every one of them was perfect, but this was just perfect place to receive this massive dose of wisdom um, about how we uh, should approach um, building a capital enterprise that's sustainable. So thank you everybody. Please give, if you've got your thing on, please give Laura a clap. And I will, you will be getting your graded essays back over, over time. We'll certainly get them before the end of the exam period for the, uh, for the um, uh, people doing 710 that are going to now be doing Shana Swan's book. Um, and so we're about to hand it in, I guess. So all the best to you. And please remember to have evaluate the course. Question. Yeah. Um, Laura, how do you not expose your mice to endocrine disrupting chemicals. <laughs> so tricky, right? Um, they live in a plastic world, so it's hard. Um, and all we can do is limit what we know to limit. Um, so we, we screen the cages to make sure that they're not leaching the kinds of things that Pat hunts. Um, I talked to you about, right? The um, and we use glass water bottles, we use wire cage racks, um, but do we buy, do I make my own mouse food? No. So I don't necessarily know for sure that there's nothing in them. So we try to limit their exposures to the chemical that we're studying, but we, and we try to limit their exposures to other um, known things that we can avoid, but there's, there's just some things you can't avoid. That's a, a great very, question. Very good.
question, Janet. Very good question. Any, are there any other questions? Well, Laura, once again, thank you so much. And that everybody, so thank you. Good luck with your exams and, uh, and everything. And uh, we'll be seeing you around, I'm sure. Okay. Happy bye summer. Bye.